I'm going to talk about how Lakota people view life after death. But first of all, we need to understand the concepts of linear and nonlinear. That's really important to know what these two things are. And then I will continue with what I want to talk about. Linear thinking is when you think everything goes in only one direction and that the further you go on that path, you think you're getting better and that everybody behind you is not as good as you. That's the tendency in linear thinking. It is very rare where a person who's way up ahead will turn around and say, here, come, I'll help you. Basic gung-ho linear thinkers think like the further they are on the path, the better they are, and anybody behind them is less than them. They're not good enough. They're not as good as them. That's the general thought. And that creates duality. Duality is when you look at everything in life and you only see two perspectives, yours and that which you don't like, that which you disagree with. And your tendency is to label that as bad and that you're the good one. That's the foundation of duality. Along with this process, people focus only on one emotion And then they become addicted to it, to the point where they'll do anything to maintain that emotion. Whatever it is, they become an addict to it. And they call the other emotions bad emotions. Stay away from those. I don't want to do anything to even feel that other emotion. They don't want to think of bad things in their life that happened that brought those emotions. They try to suppress them thinking it's going to go away. But it doesn't. The body keeps all that energy until you release it. And you release it by facing it, learning from it, making the most of it. And that's how you transform it into a learning experience. Then it becomes a blessing because you receive knowledge, wisdom, and peace. You're at peace with it. So you can think on it anytime and it doesn't bother you. That's how that works. So, non-linear thinking is Yes, things do go forward, but we can also go backwards. There's nothing wrong with that. For example, after you come to peace with your past, now you're walking a healthy road, and as you walk on this healthy road, you slowly are able to comprehend more and more of reality. Now, this does not mean you're better. It just means you can comprehend more doesn't mean you're better. It just means you can comprehend more. So, in time, it's good to look back in your past again to things you've already learned and you will see something new because now you can comprehend more of that experience. When you first had that experience, you couldn't see everything, but now you can see more which means you're going to learn something new. Then you come back to the present moment with that knowledge to help yourself and others to share. That is one possibility. You come back to the present moment because, see, when you come to peace with your past, your tendency is to stay in the present moment. That's a natural thing. That's healthy because the present thought patterns are what create the future. So it's always changing because your thoughts are changing. So it's always going to change. But you still have an influence over it. You still have a power over your future. Even though it may alter day by day, you still are influencing it. That's beautiful. So that's one of the benefits of learning from the past. Then... You can also visualize what you would like your future to be like. And then you take some time in private and act like you're already there. And you you are enjoying it. You put a smile on your face. You 
feel good. These are real emotions. Enjoy them. That process is putting something inside of you that's going to give you inspiration. Then you come back to the present moment again. Now you have something to help you to receive inspiration, to get things done. And it's going to have an influence on your real future. And it will turn out better than you think. So you're learning from the future to help you in the present moment. This is nonlinear thinking, nonlinear living, nonlinear learning. This is why we have no word for goodbye in Lakota language. Because everything is circular. What's really important is that you understand what difficulties are. But when you come to peace with your past, that's where you learn it. That's where you learn that difficulties are not a bad thing. And that you can transform them. It's so It's like they're incomplete experiences. And yes, they bring pain and sadness and anger and disappointment and fear and all kinds of things like that. But once you start learning from it and making the most of it, those emotions slowly creep out and peace comes in. They serve their purpose. Now they're out of your body. They won't bother you anymore. You've neutralized it. That's what you've done. And that's how you've come to peace with it. So, as you're living your life, and you set a goal for your future, sometimes a difficulty may come out of the blue. Just out of the blue. But you know, when you're healthy, that this is not because of something you did. It's just, it's time to learn something. And it may hurt. It may look like it's going to throw you off your path. But as long as you stop and take a look at it, face it, learn from it, make the most of it, you're still on that path. You just stopped, but you're still on that path. And as you learn from this, it's going to move you forward way in hell up there. It's like you're going to take a big jump. So it actually is getting to your goal faster. But it does require you to really work on it. So that's why Healthy people are not afraid of difficulties, even though they scare the hell out of us, they shock us. The first reaction is sometimes is extreme disappointment. We always take time to calm down. Express the emotion in a constructive way so you don't hurt anybody, anything, including yourself. Go for a vigorous run. Go for a vigorous swim. Climb trees. Really work your body as much as you can. Get that energy out. Go someplace and cry and get angry. It's okay to be scared. You let all of this energy out. Then you bring in your mind. This is how you work with your heart and your mind together. You bring in your mind and you say, okay. Still hurting a little bit, I'm still mad, I'm still disappointed, I'm still scared, but now I gotta see how I can start learning from this. And maybe you can talk to somebody that you trust and that they'll help you to calm down too. And they might see something that you don't see and they can guide you to it. Sometimes that needs to happen. Sometimes you can do it all on your own. And then you work through it, then you're like, ah, I'm feeling better now, I'm feeling better. See, you're still on the road. You're just standing, taking a rest. But you're still on the road. Then, before you know it, you're further than you thought. That, my friends, is non-linear. This is our way. That's what this is. This is the human way. Duality is the root of all problems. And it's important to understand it so that you know how to work it. And when you know how to work it, man, your life is going to really improve quality-wise. And you're going to see so much beauty around you. It's already there. But when you live this way, you're going to see it more and more. And it's really going to make you feel good. That's medicine. 
And then you understand more than you ever could before. And when blessings happen to you, you enjoy them even more than you did before. So it's a win-win situation when you do your part of learning from difficulties. Now you know what I mean by linear and non-linear. And religion is a product of duality. And duality and linear thinking go together. So that means in duality in religion, they go hand in hand. Because in religion, it's about only going in one direction only. So, okay, you're born on the earth and you join a church and you get baptized into the church because you can't get into heaven unless you're baptized on the earth when you're still alive. Then you start going to church and do whatever the church asks of you and then you die it depends on which religion you're in. You go someplace and you wait for a while before you get into heaven, if you were good. If you're not good, you go to hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So it's only going in one direction. So the further you go, the better it gets, is what it's saying. So if you're a good person, you go to heaven, Everything is perfect. There's no pain. There's only happiness. It's always light. There is no dark. The streets are paved with gold. And the rivers are flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> when A um, long time ago, when the first church preachers were preaching to old Lakota people, this is the description they gave about heaven. And they asked these old Indians, they said, wouldn't you want to go to heaven? And they said, no, I don't want to go there. See, in the Lakota world, first of all, you do not associate good with light. Light is light. It does not mean it's good. It's just light. And dark is dark. But it doesn't mean it's bad. See, we do not associate terms of good and evil to anything because there's purpose in things. Sometimes we learn from difficulty. We go through a difficulty in our lives. But when you learn from it, make the most of it, it becomes a blessing. But it's up to us. We have to do that. When we neglect to learn from our difficulties, we are the ones who transform it into a mistake. We are the ones who transform it into a mistake because of our irresponsibility and neglect to ourselves and each other. Then it's a mistake. But when we learn from it and make the most of it, it becomes a blessing. So difficulty is not a bad thing in the Lakota way. And light and dark, this is not about good and bad in the Lakota way. This is how life is. That sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's that way. Sometimes we enjoy it, and sometimes we learn. And when we learn, it turns into blessing. So either way, it's going to result in blessing. But we need them both. And when we just try to focus on one, we become addicted. When we try to only force ourselves to feel one emotion, we become addicted. This is why I don't believe in thinking positive. I don't believe in that. Tell that to these girls who get their clitorises cut off, this female circumcision. Tell that to them. They're born into a culture, and this is what they do. And they might be only 12 years old, and their family marries them off to a man who's 60-some years old. They have no choice. Now, you tell that girl, oh, just think positive, and everything will be okay. Tell that to her. She didn't do anything to deserve that. 
that kind of activity is created by man. Just like religions are. They're created by men to control that which they do not understand and that which they are afraid of, which includes women and anybody who doesn't agree with them. And they use religion to back it up. So, thinking positive is not going to work. Sometimes the solution is in the dark. So it's about facing your fears, learning from it. Some people say, hug your demons. Because they're going to show you where you still need to work on yourself. If anybody does that, that's your friend. So, light and dark are not about good and bad. Absolutely not. There's a purpose for light, and there's a purpose for dark. They're both important. It's like exhaling and inhaling. If you only focus on the light, and if you say positive is good, and you only focus on that, that's like exhaling all the time. Try that. Let's see how long you live. You have to inhale too. We need the dark. And it's not bad. And the light is not good. We need them both. Just like we need to inhale and exhale. So linear thinking only wants you to do one. Linear thinking wants you to focus only on one emotion. It only wants you to go in one direction. And linear thinking says if you go in reverse that you are going against yourself. And that you are making a fool out of yourself. That's linear thinking. So, in linear thinking, when it applies to religion, the goal is to get to this world of perfection. And then, then what? What do we do? Just sit around and play our harps all day? And jam? Eh? Jam with our harps and float around? And <laughs> I don't like milk. I don't like honey. <laughs> I'm afraid if I walk on streets that are made out of gold, I'm afraid I'm going to fall down. Yeah, <laughs> My feet are going to get cold. <laughs> so, I don't want to go to heaven either. <laughs> I, I'm lactose intolerant, so heaven is sure as hell not the place for me. <laughs> Good choice of words. Huh? Heaven sure as hell not the place for me. <laughs> okay, anyway, these old guys, we're talking like around mid-1800s in America. These old Lakota people, they did not want to go to heaven because the way that was presented to them was linear that religion, God, Jesus, the resurrection, everything is focused only on linear thinking. It only goes in one direction. And this is the reason why the Indians back in those days did not want to have anything to do with religion. Because the dark, there's something important about the dark. It's just as important as the light. Both are important. And it's not just dark and light. There's where the day turns into night, and the night turns into day. Those two points are points of transformation, but they're necessary. They're important. They have to be there. So it's not just light and dark. There's these in-between points, too. But see, religion is dualistic, so it only sees things in two. Religion sees it as day and night. But that's not how nature sees it. The earth sees it in four phases. Day, dusk, night, dawn. This is sacred. And they're all important. You can't take one away from the other. It's not possible. 
you cannot take one out because that would violate the universe. They all have to be there. But like I said, where it gets to be a mistake is when men try to categorize it in only two groups, day and night. Day is good, night is bad. That's man that creates that idea, not nature. Nature says we need it all. And it's not about good and bad. So to have a place of perfection is not possible. The universe is not perfect. The idea of perfection is an idea that was created by man because of his inferiority complex, his insecurity. This is dualistic man. So these long time ago Indians, they were not dualistic people. They knew that night is important. There's a purpose for it. Dusk and dawn are sacred times. They need to be here. It's not about day and night. It's about day, dusk, night, dawn. And they're all important. And none of them are good or bad. They're just important. We need the whole thing to live. So this is why Indians did not want to go to church. They did not want to go to heaven in the beginning. I'm talking about before reservation time. So I'm talking like early 1800s to mid-1800s. Late 1800s started to change because of the reservation. But I'm talking about before the reservation. So the whole idea of resurrection is a linear process. And this violates natural universal law, which means that it is a man-made concept. Nothing resurrects. There is no resurrection. That's an idea that man made up. This is not reality. That is fantasy. Anyway, when I was a kid, there used to be this show that came on on Easter Sunday. And this was about a little girl. And she went to visit her grandmother for the Easter holiday weekend. So in this show, she travels there, and she gets there on Friday, and she's really happy to see her grandmother, and her grandmother is really happy to see her too. And then on Sunday, the grandmother dies. And this little girl, she doesn't understand the concept of death. Where did grandma go, she says. And so her parents are saying, she went to be with Jesus. So she said, why? Doesn't she want to be with me, she said. And so they have this discussion and then they explain to her the resurrection. And when I was a little kid, I was like, Jesus is sad. <laughs> I don't like this show. <laughs> I, just, I was like, I thought this was going to be about painting eggs and then having the adults hide the eggs and then all the kids go Easter egg hunting and have a picnic afterwards. Because that's how I knew Easter. Huh? <laughs> I didn't like this resurrection nonsense. And so <laughs> I really didn't like that show. And then I was like, geez, what a crazy show. This is supposed to be for little kids. But it's about dying. And I was like, this is... Uh, I don't know about this. 
I did not feel good when I watched that show. I was troubled. I was disturbed. I wasn't happy that the grandmother was allegedly in heaven with Jesus. That didn't make me happy. I felt sad for the little girl. I said, I thought, that's not fair. It doesn't give you a good enough reason to accept it. So I felt the show was poorly done. I'm a little kid and I'm thinking like this. Yeah. <laughs> I was strange <laughs> as a little kid. I thought of things that other little kids didn't think of. <laughs> anyway, when I grew up, when I was a little kid, we didn't learn these things. For us, Easter was a four-day weekend, so no school on Good Friday and Easter Monday. So Thursday before, we were all happy because we don't have to go to school for four days. And didn't even have to go to school on Monday. Yeah, that was so cool. So when we saw Good Friday on the calendar, we didn't think, oh, this is when they hammered Jesus to the cross. We didn't even know about that. For us, it was a Good Friday because there was no school. That's why it was a Good Friday. That's how it was for us, for us Indian kids. And Monday, it was Easter Monday, it's no school. But for us, Easter meant dying eggs. That was fun to do that. Parents are making the Easter meal, which for us was roast pork and mashed potatoes and gravy, roast carrots, corn. My mom always ate sweet potatoes. She liked sweet potatoes. So while that's happening, we're usually playing. And then the next day, they have the Easter egg hunt. Usually the parents still hide the eggs around the house and stuff like that. So early in the morning, kids are going out there with their Easter baskets and looking for the Easter eggs and stuff like that. It's just a fun activity. And then, as I grew older, the community did this. There was a little park nearby, and they would hide Easter eggs all over the park. What was good about the community one is sometimes the eggs are plastic, and then there would be a note on the inside that you win a little toy or something. This community one was Saturday morning. So Saturday morning, all the kids would gather at a certain place in the park, and then somebody there, some adult, would say, okay, on your mark, get set, ready, go. Yeah, and egg kids are running all over the park looking for Easter eggs. And if you get one of these plastic ones, you're supposed to bring it to this one vehicle, and you show them the note, and there's toys in the back. So whatever the note says, then they give you that toy. And it's just a small toy. Usually they were these airplanes that are made out of thin wood that you assemble. Geez, that's a long time ago, man. Oh, wow, I totally forgot about those. Those were so cool. They had a rubber band attached to a propeller. Geez, that's a one hell of a toy. Oh, man, childhood memories. I so loved them. <laughs> or sometimes it was those little rubber ball that's attached to the rubber band, and that rubber band is attached to the ping-pong paddle. Yeah, So you hit your little rubber ball like that, dong, 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 whatever. Just little toys like that. And sometimes it was a candy bar. So cool. Yeah, these community-wide Easter egg hunts. They were really, really cool events when I was a kid. But that's it. That is what Easter was for us. And singing that song, Here Comes Peter Cottontail. <laughs> That's what Easter was for us. It wasn't religious at all. There was no churchy theme associated with it. 
for us Indian kids. So I didn't learn about this Jesus being nailed on the cross and crucified and that somebody poked him with the spear and he was crucified with two criminals. Shoot, I didn't learn about that till I was in university. And I saw it in the movie. The movie was called Jesus of Nazareth. And it was the first time I knew about that. That, oh, this is a church thing. Uh-huh. But how in the hell does a uh, Easter rabbit fit in there? And the Easter eggs, where in the heck does that come from? Where in the Bible does it talk about Peter Cottondale? I have no idea. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> where does it talk about Easter eggs and dying eggs and stuff like that? What does it say about that in the Bible? It doesn't. See, rabbits reproduce a lot, very fast. In some cultures, rabbits represent ongoing life. Eggs are the same thing. In other cultures, an egg represents this too. Fertility. Fertility leading to life. This is what these symbols mean from certain cultures. And when the Catholics were invading all these countries all over the world, what they did was to get the local people to go to church, they would take some concepts from the local culture and incorporate it with Catholic teachings. And this is how the Easter egg bunny and hiding Easter eggs that's how all of this came into play. It's forcing a local cultural concepts into a Catholic idea. And then the Christians did the same thing. That's where it starts. That's how churches got people from other cultures to join their church was they take a cultural story or some kind of concept and then they take only the part that fits with the Bible and then Christianize it. I didn't learn this information till later, till I was in university. Then I, I started checking these things out because I wanted to know. Why is it that people do this, dying eggs and then going around hiding the eggs and then kids picking up the eggs and why is the rabbit involved in all this because rabbits don't lay eggs so how come the rabbit has eggs they don't even make sense so i wanted to know the answer so i researched it and that's what i found out that catholics used certain ideas from other cultures and then they catholicized it they did the same thing to indians as well so, a lot of today's Indians believe that when you die, you go to a place called the Happy Hunting Ground. Now, I never heard of that. Happy Hunting Ground. See, it's taking everything that Indians were missing at the beginning of the reservation Christian brainwashing happened to Indian people in the early 1900s at the beginning of the reservation. See, Indians were forced onto reservations and they couldn't hunt. So, to create something for Indians to get them to come to church, they have to take something that Indians really want in their life. Because at the beginning of the reservations, it was extreme poverty and starvation. And everything was awful. People were not feeling good at all. So the church priest said, okay, Indians need to be happy. So let's use the word happy. Indians were not allowed to have guns or knives at the beginning of the reservation, so that meant they could not hunt. 
then there's no Buffalo. Buffalo Bill, Cody, and some other guys, they almost wiped out the Buffalo to extinction. Almost. There was a time in American history where there were only 50 Buffalo. Only 50 Buffalo were left from several million down to 50. That's not good. They almost wiped them all out. Just like Indians, they almost wiped us all out too. So the church priests were saying, okay, Indians, they need to be happy and they're not hunting anymore, so let's present heaven as a place where they'll be happy and that they can hunt anytime they want. And so they developed this concept and called it the happy hunting ground, where Indians go after they die and all their relatives are there See, this is a heaven concept here. All their relatives are there waiting for them, and they're having celebrations all the time because every day some Indian is dying someplace. So every day there are celebrations in the happy hunting ground, and, and every day they're hunting and they're feasting and they're happy forever and ever and ever and ever. It's a Christian concept, and it's linear. That's not an ancient belief. An ancient belief, our soul has several pieces. One piece belongs to the earth. So when we die, the earth piece returns to the earth. We go to a certain star constellation. And there we drop off another soul piece that belongs to this part of the universe. And then we have two pieces left. With those two pieces, we go to a certain location, another location, to find out if these two pieces have the same level of development. If they don't, we turn around, we come back to that constellation, we pick up another piece again from the universe. So our soul has three pieces. And then we wait for a child that's going to be born. And then we enter that child when it takes its first breath. And that child already has a piece from the earth. When a woman gets pregnant, as soon as she conceives, the earth gives a piece of her soul to that baby, even though it's just minuscule. It's still gets a soul piece from the earth. And so as it develops inside the mother, it has a soul piece, it has emotions, it has a body, and it's forming a mind. So it has four parts of the self. So when the baby is born, it has the earth soul piece in it. And when it takes its first breath, a soul with three pieces, this is a piece of you, a piece that measures you, and a universe piece, those three pieces join the baby, and they join with the earth soul piece. So when the baby is on the earth, the baby has four parts of the soul and lives its life however. Then it grows up, or whatever happens, and it dies. That cycle happens again. The earth piece returns to the earth. The soul goes back to that constellation, drops off the universe piece, and it goes to this location to see if the levels match. And it keeps doing that over and over and over. This is reincarnation. This means we come to the earth thousands of times. But the lifetimes before are not important anymore. They're done. They're over. What's important is how you live your life now. The most important lifetime is the one that you have right now. It don't matter if you're white or Indian or whatever. That doesn't matter. What matters is how do you live your life? Do you talk to the earth? Things like that. That's how you develop your soul. How you communicate. And how do you receive communication? Do you learn from your difficulties? This is how you develop your soul. 
Are you emotionally healthy? You have to be emotionally healthy, otherwise your soul cannot develop. So it doesn't matter what culture you're from. What's important is how do you live your life? Because let me tell you, I know some guys who do the Sundance. They're drunk all year long. They beat up their wives, their girlfriends. They're mean to their kids. Next Sundance time comes, they act all holier than thou, and they're just this goody-goody guy and everything. They help old people and everything like that. But as soon as that fifth day comes, they're back at the bar getting drunk again. So just because a man does ceremonies, that does not mean he's good. Ceremonies are not going to save you. Ceremonies serve a different purpose. So when somebody tells you that he does satlad ceremonies every day, that does not mean jack shit. When somebody tells you he's a sun dancer, that does not mean a goddamn thing. What's more important than ceremonies is how do you live your life. It don't matter if your culture has no ceremonies. What's important is how do you live your life. How do you communicate to others? How do you receive communication from others? How do you learn from your difficulties? These are what's important. It's not the color of your skin or the language that you speak. It's how do you live your life. That's going to decide if your soul is going to develop or not. So you see, the concept of heaven does not make sense in the Lakota ancient perspective. The happy hunting ground is a Christian concept. And remember what I said with this Christian brainwashing thing. Today, most Native people are incredibly Christian influenced. They believe in a one creator concept. But ancient Lakota star knowledge says no, there is no one creator. There's a whole bunch. Some of them are male. Some of them are female. Some of them are both gender. Some of them don't even have a gender. What ancient Lakota star knowledge talks about, the Christians cannot comprehend it because they're closed-minded. Duality limits your vision. This is why it's important to know what duality is. That's why I talk about it. What is duality? This is what it is. Two concepts. Good versus evil. That's all man-made. Nature does not abide by good versus evil. Not at all. We need to learn from nature. Not from some book written by men. We need to watch and observe and learn from nature because if it weren't for nature, we would die immediately. Right now, we're living a comfortable life. We go to the store. We buy our food. We buy our clothes. Everything is already made. We're so comfortable. But there may come a time when you have to make your own food and you have to make your own clothes. And how are you going to do that? Observing and living with nature. It's really important. What is important is right now, right now, how you are living your life. This is the most important moment right now because how you are thinking right now is going to decide what your future is going to be. This is where you have power in the present moment. So it has nothing to do with creator knows my path. It has nothing to do with that. You make your path 
by how you live your life. You are the one who does it. So this happy hunting ground concept is kind of silly. For when you look at it from the ancient perspective, it keeps you intoxicated on the false idea, and it's based on fear of death. And if you're not scared of death, it will do what it has to do to scare you. So you will have that fear. That's what duality does. It wants you to have that fear. So if you're not afraid to die, it's going to do something to make sure you do get that fear. That's linear thinking. It's oppressing. It wants you to oppress yourself. In Lakota Star Knowledge, even if a person is afraid to die, this is not a bad thing. It's natural to feel that way. There's nothing wrong with feeling that way because sometimes it happens suddenly. Sometimes you don't know. So you need to make your life as best as you can with what you have. That's what's important. Because putting all your hopes into an idea and that idea is really just an illusion. It's a lie. And to put all your energy into this universal lie, that is sad. You're really missing a lot of things in your life when you believe in the universal lie of resurrection. In the Lakota world, it doesn't even make sense. In nature, it doesn't even make sense. Resurrection doesn't even make sense to nature because the idea of resurrection is created by man with inferiority complex, emotional insecurity, low self-esteem, low self-worth, because he's afraid of that which he doesn't understand, so he feels he must destroy it with oppression. And that is the foundation of religion, and that is where the idea of heaven and hell comes from, to scare you. It's all a scare tactic. That is not love. To scare you about a hell, this is not love. And Lakota Star Knowledge, there is no hell, but there is no heaven either. There's no angels, there's no demons, there's no God, and there's no Satan. Because those ideas are created by man to scare the shit out of you so you will go to church and pay your tithing or whatever the church asks of you, saying, you will go to heaven if you do all these things, where you'll be eternally happy. That's the life of a junkie. It's not possible. Emotions are a part of learning experiences. They're a part of blessings. We're going to experience all of them many times. Many times. From some you learn. From some you enjoy. And when you learn, that's blessing. So there is no good versus evil. Positive is not good Negative is not bad. It's man who created that concept, not nature. So we should be paying attention to nature. That's what I do. I like to be in nature. I just don't want to camp. <laughs> To learn more about 
Lakota spirituality, I have written a book called Wichocha Otehike. This book also includes Lakota star knowledge information. All the videos that I make, which are about Lakota spirituality, Lakota star knowledge, and cultural information, are based on this book. This book costs 99 American dollars. This price includes the shipping cost as well as a tracking number. And to learn more about Lakota language, I have written a Lakota language book called Chante et Owoglake, Speaking from the Heart. And all my Lakota language videos are based on this book. This book costs 119 American dollars. This price includes the shipping cost as well as a tracking number. I also teach online and I give spiritual consultations as well. If you are interested in any of my services and products, you can send payment via PayPal to my email address, which is hechaka7 at yahoo.com. That's H-E-H-A-K-A, -A, the number 7, at yahoo.com. When you send your payment, please include your shipping address and your email address. Ho, oh, Lila Pilamaelo. Thank you very much.